Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Raj Sword. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in private practice in Harley Street, and I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Neil Greenberg, who's a professor of defence mental health. Professor Neil Greenberg is an academic psychiatrist based at King's College London, UK, and is a consultant occupational and forensic psychiatrist. Neil served in the United Kingdom Armed Forces for more than 23 years and has been deployed as a psychiatrist and a researcher to a number of hostile environments, including Afghanistan and Iraq. At uh, King's College London, Neil is one of the senior members of the military mental health research team and is a principal investigator within a nationally funded health protection research unit, which researches the psychological impacts of disasters on organizations. Neil also runs March on Stress, which is a psychological health consultancy and also chairs the Royal College of Psychiatrists special interest group in occupational psychiatry. So, Neil, many thanks indeed for joining us today. We're going to have a chat about a recent paper that's been published in The Lancet, and you're one of the authors, about the psychological impact impact of quarantine. Um, let's start, first of all, because the paper was very specific in trying to define, they wanted to focus on the fact that lots of things are stressful, but they wanted to focus on the stress of quarantine. So could you say a little bit about what quarantine is um, uh, before we get into what, what the paper found? Yeah, sure. So um, quarantine is the process of putting people who might have been exposed to an infectious agent um, in uh, isolation or by themselves in order to see whether they develop symptoms. Um, and if they do, that they get on and get treated. And if they don't develop symptoms, then they are assumed to be non-infectious and they can go about their daily life. Um, isolation, on the other hand, is the process that happens when uh, when people have been uh, found to be infectious. Um, so they might be in a hospital. They might, if they have mild symptoms, uh, still be at home. And isolation goes on uh, for the period that the disease is known to be infectious for. And one of the points I think the paper is making is that the psychological consequences of quarantine are quite significant. Therefore, the decision should not be taken lightly when to put people in quarantine. I wonder if you could say something about that. Yeah, well, um, the the paper was a was a rapid um, evidence based systematic review of of the literature, and it, we did this paper on the basis that obviously there's the COVID nineteen outbreak, and um, at the time that we did this, countries around the world, including the UK, were um, looking at using um, quarantine or uh, supported isolation, as it was was called at the time, in order to try and protect the members of the general public. Um, and um, having looked through all the, uh, the, the over a thousand papers, we, we managed to sort of whittle it down to 24 that were, were relevant to this topic. But it is fair to say that actually what the world is going through at the moment with COVID-19 are, as has been said a number of times, you know, unprecedented times. And, and really, there, there weren't any academic papers which were able to consider circumstances that were very similar to the specifics of what's going on at the moment. So um, we, we did indeed find when we looked at the, the reviewed literature that there is a potential for quarantine uh, to cause not just short term distress and frustration, which is perhaps uh, unsurprising, but also the potential to cause longer term mental health problems. But but the other side to, to flip it the other way around is it certainly also showed that our review that actually not everybody needs to go on and, and suffer mental health problems as a result of, of going through quarantine. And that actually, if you end up doing quarantine well, and I'm sure we'll discuss what, what that means, um, then actually um, there's no reason to think that quarantine necessarily needs to cause a long term impact on people's mental health. Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss what, what doing it well means. But um, just to, to go over that point, although the research you reviewed found significant numbers of people suffering from mental health problems, it wasn't the case that it was ever really the majority. In fact, the majority seemed to survive fairly well. Is that is that right? Absolutely. And, and and that that particular finding is it was unsurprising to the research team, even if you do research projects on large scale traumas and sort of disasters, uh, terrorist incidents, uh, fires, uh, assaults and the like. We still find that the majority of people exposed to the most horrendous of circumstances um, go on and actually do OK. And, and, and thankfully, it's only the unfortunate minority who usually develop longer term mental health difficulties as a result of any challenging event of which quarantine is an example.
And one theory about why there's human variability in, in this is about coping response, that if you mount the right coping response, you can survive difficulty. Uh, I don't know what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, well, if you look at um, challenging incidents uh, across the board, so not just quarantine, but also traumatic events at large scale or small scale, you can broadly um, split the um, the the risk factors, the reasons why people go on and become unwell into three groups. So you can split them into things that were present before the trauma happens. You can talk about the trauma itself and then you can talk about what happens after the trauma. And when we look at those three groups of uh, risk factors, although people are often really interested at trying to identify who's at risk uh, beforehand, you know, so what's their education, what's their gender, what's their childhood history, what's their psychological makeup, have they had mental health problems in the past? And and people uh, speculate and, and in, indeed research tells us that some of those risk factors are, are, are increase the risk that someone may have mental health problems later on. But when we look at all three of those groups, we find that it's consistently what happens after the trauma that makes the biggest difference. So actually, um, for a classic traumatic event that, that is normally quite short, to be fair, the actual event itself, it's how people are supported after the event uh, and how much pressure or stress they're put through as they're trying to recover. Now, I think with quarantine, it's slightly different because quarantine isn't just a specific moment in time. Um, you know, it goes on for days and days or in some cases, of course, weeks and weeks. Um, so I think you are right to say that actually it's the way that you cope with the ongoing stress of the quarantine that will also determine whether it is whether you go on later to develop a mental health problem or not. But I wouldn't I wouldn't at all take away from the evidence and what the evidence tells us is that actually it's what happens when the situation ends that probably is the most predictive of whether someone does well or not could you say something about what the different possible things that could happen to you after something ends which influence the outcome in terms of your mental health yeah so so for instance what we know is that after a traumatic event um if you are um, provided with good social support, so you speak to your friends or your colleagues or your family members or other trusted individuals, and that person um, speaks to you about the event and you probably give up just little bits of information about what your concerns and worries were about the event and also your concerns and worries about the future, that's, that's called you know, good old social support. And social support is shown consistently to be protective of someone's mental health. Now, it's fair to say that not all social support, even if it's well-intentioned, is good for mental health. I mean, imagine the situation that you you had a really bad time and you go down to the pub when you were allowed to uh, and have a pint of beer with your friend and that you tell them all about your woes and, and how, how bad things were and what happened. And, and your friend is, is tries to be a really good friend. And they say, do you know what, Neil? Um, that sounds really terrible and it sounds really horrible. Do you know what? I had a friend like you once and they were never the same since. Anyway, let's talk about the football. And and so the intention of your friend is to kind of acknowledge and be supportive, but that they might have um, unintentionally put into your mind that actually things are never going to be the same and, and, and you're going to be really unwell. So in most senses, we know social support is is really helpful, but but it's not a universal truth that, that it always is. The other factor that has been identified is about um, looking at the recovery environment. And so by that, what I mean is that in the periods of days, weeks and months after a traumatic event, um, how much pressure or stress you're put through during that period makes a huge difference. So I'll give you an example of um, someone I saw many years ago. They were in the emergency services and they've been involved in a in a really, really difficult incident. Uh, um, and in it, they had become injured themselves and they had to go to hospital. And in the in the incident itself, they, they were they, they suffered a lot of uh, physical damage, but also their personal equipment they had on them, which they needed to, to, to use for the for the job they were doing. The personal equipment was broken and damaged. So when they um, came out of hospital and come back and came back to work, unsurprisingly, their boss said, you know what, I'm really pleased to have you back at work. Anything we can do to make it easier. Do let me know. And so this particular uh, emergency services person, they, they went back to their boss and they said, listen, thanks ever so much for saying that. Um, actually, the personal equipment that, that I had during the incident that got damaged, it's going to cost a, 130 pounds for me to replace that. You know, could I possibly have, have that money? And he remembers his boss saying, I'm sorry, we, we don't do new for old in our organisation. Um, I tell you what, we'll give you 30 quid. 
So this person had to had to fight really hard. They had to get their union involved. They had to get the, the, the deputy head of the whole service involved in order to get their 130 pounds. Now, it might seem like a small thing to you, but what this said to the person in their head is this organization doesn't really care. They, they haven't got my back. They're, they're not really interested in in trying to help me get back on my feet. And unfortunately, that particular individual went on and developed post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And um, they eventually, in spite of having had treatment, didn't really get better. And they ended up getting medically discharged. Now, I can't promise you that if their employer had said, do you know what? You did really well during that incident. Here, I tell you what, have 140 pounds. And thank you so much for your service. I can't promise you they wouldn't have got PTSD, but I can promise you that their organization didn't really stack the cards in their favor. And they provided a recovery environment that was stressful, difficult, and also led to a loss of trust with with, with that individual's employer. So there's um, social support, there's the organizational environment. Um, Anything else that influences the outcome? Oh, well, 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 there are, are, of course, a whole a whole range of other things, such as um, other stresses that go on in your in your life. You know, so if you if you were going, say, through a a divorce before, um, then that's not going to make the recovery environment any easier. So really stress from any source. And then we come on also to to uh, people's coping styles. So, again, after challenging events, it's not uncommon that uh, people um start to resort to to poor habits as a way of trying to cope. So that might mean drinking too much. It might mean stopping exercising. It might mean smoking or gambling uh, or withdrawal from others. And and we know that poor coping, um, again, is indicative that, that that people won't go on and do well. And probably of all the um, of all the different uh, facets to to trauma psychology that I think is is useful is is people avoiding things that stress them um, related to the event is probably the, the most perpetuating. So by that, I mean that if actually you've been involved in a road traffic accident and therefore you don't want to go out and cross roads and don't want to get into cars and say so you stay in a lot, actually in the short term, you feel psychologically more safe because you haven't exposed yourself to the the stressful incident uh, and, and reminder, which, which makes you worried and, and upset and frustrated. But the problem is then by not going out, you create a whole range of other difficulties. You start to think that you're not the sort of person who goes out anymore, that people don't like you, that you can't do things. And it begins to to sort of impact on your self-esteem. So in a general sense, after traumatic events and, and you know, quarantine is an example, although not classically traumatic, we need to avoid avoidance. So we need to kind of face the things that that cause us to feel slightly anxious uh, hopefully, you know, we overcome that or we talk to about others and we try to carry on with our normal lives. And for most of us, that is is successful and, and helps us get back to normal. So over a period of a few days, weeks or months, the the uh, distress that we initially feel begins to subside and we become more interested in, you know, whether we can get toilet roll at the shops or whether uh, our favorite program is on television. Um, but unfortunately for a few of us, those avoidance behaviors, those safety behaviors um, set up a pattern of of existence that actually means that you you stay distressed and you, your life becomes restricted. And that's when people start to fall into becoming what we would say is psychologically unwell. One of the factors that the review paper um, you, you're part of um, looked at was the length of time uh, of the quarantine. And that seemed to have a significant effect. Um, I wonder if you could say something about that. And, and the other thing that the paper talks about is clear communication uh, between the authorities and the people in quarantine. Yeah. So on the on the length of time, it, it's it's not surprising that the longer a period of uh, a stressful circumstance, the more impact it has on your mental health. So, you know, it, even in a classic um, work stress sense, if you if you're at work and you're you're really busy for a week on a particular project and then it calms down. Well, you, you, you know that, that that's OK. But if that week turns into two weeks and a month and two months, again, it's not surprising that those in uh, stresses which are continual are more likely to impact upon your mental health we, we don't get the downtime that we need we don't get the mental uh, ability to to process and come to terms with what's going on because we're too busy just getting through it in the first place so it's not surprising that the longer duration uh, would be linked to worse mental health um 
I'm sorry, I forget. What, what was the second point that you asked about? Well, well it was about the government um, yes. or the authorities speaking to you. Because what's happening right now is the government or the authorities are saying that this could go on for a very long period of time. And I wondered what your thoughts were about that, given that your study, the review paper said clear communication, truthful communication, but also don't make it go on for too long. And that, so it seems to be there's slight tension there between what's happening right now. No, I, I, I think the slight tension is, is, is entirely correct. But, but really, it's about people having an understandable rationale uh, for what's going on. So, you know, if we're talking about the current situation, um, unfortunately, there are many people who are unwell and, and people who are dying each day. And I think the evidence that uh, people are dying and also we've seen videos made by um, NHS staff saying, stay at home, you know, look what's happening. Look, look what we're dealing with. That sort of evidence actually sets up, I think, in most people's minds that actually the um, the staying at home principles we have to do now are proportionate to the risk out there. Now, if for some reason, and this would have been lovely, and I hope it, it becomes the truth, that the National Health Service you know, goes above and beyond and saves far more lives than, than ever was expected. And so actually not many people die. And um, actually it looks to all intents and purposes that actually the health service is dealing with it remarkably well, but yet we're still told to stay at home, then actually the rationale doesn't seem to, to be proportionate. So what people need to understand uh, about quarantine is, is that what we are being asked to do, our restriction, the restrictions put on our lifestyles is proportionate to the real risk out there. Um, and that's, that's one of the important pieces about getting the right information the, the other part about that, which is really important, is about what the media does, because the media, in many cases, fuels people's anxiety. It increases uh, people's uncertainty. It gives us stories from experts who who challenge the official view, who come out with um, stories that you know things will never be the same again and, and this will be permanently different and much, much worse. And so the media tends to... Um, give us lots of information which actually causes us to have to have mental health difficulties uh, more commonly. So our, the advice, which which is government advice, and I, I think is very much backed up by the um, by, by the research, both our research and, and, and research associated with this topic, is that people need to restrict their um, their access and their viewing of, of the media stories out there uh, very much, particularly if they find that when they see them, it, it makes them more anxious. The other thing that your review suggests, and one of the very surprising things, is that um, for a long time after the quarantine is over, people could continue to experience mental health difficulties. And and um, some of the research seems to suggest it, it goes on for as long as three years after the quarantine is over. Could you say something about that extended period of time that was one of the findings? Yeah, that, that was probably the most um, surprising finding um, for, from this review. So... Um, Diagnostically, there is a group of mental health disorders called adjustment disorders uh, and adjustment disorders are very common. Um, in fact, in the military, where I've got a lot of experience, they're the most commonly diagnosed mental health problems seen by mental health services. But in most of our lives, we, um, we if you had an adjustment disorder, you wouldn't end up going to see a mental health specialist. So adjustment disorders refer to situations where something's gone on. You've had a stressful event. You've not got a job. You've had a relationship breakup. Um, your best friends decided that they don't like you, whatever that might be. And the impact of that particular event causes you to become highly distressed and, and to some degree non-functional. But what we know about adjustment disorders is that um, over a period of weeks to months and normally up to six months, um, once the stressor goes away, then people recover. So we fully anticipated that actually as a stressful occurrence, quarantine would would count and that people could become distressed. But mostly that distress would recover over time. But as you said, we found that not the majority, but an important minority of people actually suffered long term mental health difficulties uh, because of it. Um, and we weren't able to fully determine in the in the paper that the reasons the reasons for that. But but we do know that the risk factors for going on and developing longer term mental health problems include um, in your head having um, poor information about the rationale for it, um, not having access to uh, basic supplies. So food, sanitary products, health products, not being able to communicate well with people uh, outside of the quarantine period being financially um, uh, in a very difficult situation because of quarantine, 
and also importantly um two last pieces was was um having quarant the quarantine period extended when you thought you were about to get out uh and then lastly um the stigma that sometimes can come of having been in quarantine and what we know about stigma is that if you think back to the early days, uh, not that long ago now, of when we were the UK was flying people back from around the world and pushing them in quarantine for two weeks. Um, when those people came out, um, there was a potential that the rest of the population would see them as somehow dirty or infected or dangerous in some way. And therefore, they would stigmatise them. So they, they wouldn't want to associate with them, even though, um, in theory, that person was no longer infectious. And we know that that impact of stigma can have long lasting consequences. I guess in the situation we find ourselves in at the moment, we're all pretty much in the same boat. And actually, um, we we think that the the uh, the risk of people being stigmatised because they've had to stay at home is pretty small because we're all having to do it. So in that sense, the current we're all in it together situation is perhaps slightly less risky from a psychological viewpoint. Um, so in, in terms of um, the long term effects, th there wasn't just an, a, a finding in terms of um, psychiatric disorder, but just avoidance behaviours seem to increase in general. And, and the other interesting thing is that healthcare workers seem to be um, a, a group of people you thought from your review should be paid special attention to, that they seem to be a bit neglected. Uh, again, any thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I mean, healthcare workers, um, I mean, in, particularly in, in any quarantine period, particularly in the pa current pandemic, that they are in a, a really challenging position because, um, in one sense, they're at increased risk of, of catching infection, so that that places them in a psychologically more vulnerable position in the first case. And of course, they they unfortunately see the really bad outcomes that, that can occur. So thinking that they might have the disease can be more psychologically challenging for them than maybe the rest of us who don't perhaps thankfully understand the the full scale of, of what a particular disease disease can do. The other thing is, of course, they tend to have a very strong work ethic and team ethos, ethos, and they really do want to get back to the front, to get back to the fight against uh, a particular disease in a really, really strong way. So when they're, they're removed from their colleagues, not able to save lives, not able to help others, but also not able to support their teammates, um, they, they can really feel that they, they've let other people down. Uh, and that sense of guilt or shame uh, can be quite toxic. And, and that, again, that does indeed put them at, uh, in, a, in a group who are definitely at higher risk. Now, one of the things your paper didn't look at, and therefore this is probably a very unfair question to throw at you, but given that this current pandemic is worldwide, I wondered, because it didn't seem to appear in the review, whether there were cultural differences in coping, because there is a sense in which different governments, like maybe in China or, or, or other countries of South Korea, um, are handling it differently. And maybe there's an argument sometimes that they're being more authoritarian and that therefore certain cultures... Uh, accept that more than other cultures I, I know it's an unfair question but I wondered if you have any thoughts about whether culture can have an, an effect well I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure it, it can uh, and I think I would I would speculate in the same direction that you would that actually uh, people who live in cultures who are more who are naturally more authoritarian would find it easier to comply with this rule as they have indeed complied with others Perhaps one, and this is anecdotal, so, you know, this is not high quality science, but one anecdotal um, observation I would make about the current situation is I'm still very much involved with a lot of my work um, to deal with the mental health of veterans, which is what I do a lot of the time. And having spoken and carry on speaking to lots of colleagues who are also dealing with the same situation is, is I think many of the veterans may actually wear this better than others because if you've been in the military, you've been used to being told that you're going away to somewhere for many months and that you can't do this and you can't do that. And you have to obey the rules and be here on time. And although you don't really want to do that at times, you understand that for the nature and the uh, of the operation or for the greater good, everyone has to stick to the rules because that's what gets a whole bunch of military personnel to complete a particular mission. And I think in this sense, actually, you know, the government rationale at the moment, I think, is pretty sound. And I think most military veterans will, will, will find, actually, do you know what? I'd rather not do it, but I completely understand why. So let's just get on with it. And so in a cultural sense, yes, there's international cultural differences. But I also think there are groups of workers. I'm speculating here the emergency services may also be in a similar uh, sort of similar situation who will actually find that complying with with what seem to be reasonably um, reasonable rules is, is something that they can do quite easily.
and and being very speculative if there's people out there who who aren't very good at obey, obeying the rules at the best of time i guess they're going to find the current restrictions more difficult again this is probably an unfair question because your your review doesn't really go into this in in a huge amount of detail but any, any thoughts because we're running out of time so maybe this is the last question a, a, any thoughts about um advice you would give i mean there's advice around in the media have a structure to your day um do something distracting absorbing um try not to look at the media too much etc uh, etc et any any other thoughts about advice that you would give particularly advice you think is not around that much in the media to help people go th- who are going through this right now well i, I think um th- th- there's two other bits what one of which i think is in the media quite a lot and the other perhaps slightly less so and um, so the, the, f- the first piece i would suggest is about communication with others is trying to recreate your social support network uh remotely so most of us get our social support um, sort of uh, dose each day by going to work, by seeing people out, uh, by informally interacting with people in a way that actually we don't think of as being active social support. It's just little bits uh, throughout the day. And of course, we may well not get that at the moment, particularly not if you happen to live by yourself or if you may be more elderly and, and not able to, to use um, sort of social media and communication tools so so freely. So I think one active piece of coping would be make an active effort to stay more in touch with people than you normally normally would. And that might be sending them the funny picture. It might be having a free WhatsApp uh, conversation message on a regular basis. But I think we need to try and recreate that social network, which is both good for our own mental health. And I think is also likely to be good for the mental health of the people we communicate with. The second piece, I would say, um, it revolves around um uh, the, the interaction between physical and mental health. So again, people who are in in challenging situations like the current one, they, they often think, well, you know, if I can't do everything I want, what's the point? So they kind of let themselves go a bit. They don't sleep so well. They stay up watching uh, TV till late at night. They, they don't eat very well. Uh, they don't take any exercise. They may resort to more addictive behaviours like gambling, smoking or, or, or drinking. Um, and they don't really do things that ordinarily give them pleasure because they can't really be bothered. Uh, and I think we know that if you just did that normally, that would put you into a, a poor state of physical well-being. And that inevitably would would affect your your mental health to some degree and also your your resilience to weather the storm. So I think the piece of advice would be that actually, although this is a unpleasant situation, if you can do anything to turn this into an opportunity to make yourself more healthy, to come out of it, you know, a bit lighter, maybe a bit fitter, um, having learned a new skill, whatever it might be that that would help improve your self-esteem that's likely to be a good strategy um and so i i think look after yourself think about the interaction between how you physically feel and your mental health at this time and try and push the cards or stack the cards in your favor i think that's likely to be helpful professor neil greenberg professor of defense mental health um thank you very much indeed and the title of the paper is the psychological impact of quarantine and how to reduce it rapid review of the evidence and it's available at the lancet website neil thank you very much indeed most welcome